Good evening. Welcome to uh, the Bondage Breaker, Lesson 11, uh, The Danger of Deception. This is M.T. Clark at Rock Solid Church. Um, we just uh, worship to Big Daddy Kane's I Am Redeemed. And thank God we're redeemed. And uh, before we get started, I'd like to op- open us all up in prayer. Um, uh, this is the MT for Christ 24-7 podcast, by the way, and uh, I, I thank God for the people listening on the podcast as well as the people here. Um, let's begin. Lord God, Heavenly Father, thank you for uh, uh, bringing us here tonight, um, or, or to those who are listening in afar. Lord, we just thank you for um, all you've done in our lives. You, we thank you for the redemption that you've given us through Jesus Christ. We thank you for the power of the Holy Spirit that you put on put into us when we said yes to Jesus. And we thank you for the freedom uh, that we've come to know by, by uh, agreeing with what you say is true about us instead of what the world would say. Lord, we thank you for saving us. We thank you for remaking us. And uh, we pray for uh, the Holy Spirit to anoint tonight's teaching, um, to anoint the podcast, uh, and to uh, to bring a revelation of truth uh, to, to all of us uh, that we didn't quite understand before, we didn't quite grasp before. Um, we're always here to learn from you, Lord, and we're humbled that you would teach us. Um, so thank you, God. Uh, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. Um, yeah, I would say uh, we, I, I, I miss some of the people that aren't here tonight. I know some of them are not here because they're being held <laughs> um, held um, against their will. Um, but... but um, Things happen in life where you're detained and uh, you can't make it. So um, we pray for we've been praying for them, um, and we pray for the people. Uh, I pray for Doreen Smith, who's recovering from her um, surgery, um, as well as as. Uh, uh, so we pray for healing for Doreen and her foot. Um, but. On with the lesson. Tonight's uh, lesson is uh, the bond- from the Bondage Breaker. Obviously, it's from from uh, Neil Anderson's book, um, The Bondage Breaker, Chapter 11, um, The Danger of Deception. And uh, most of what you'll hear tonight comes right out of the book, so it's not a big surprise. If you miss something, grab the book uh, and read it, or you can always listen to the podcast again. Um, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, says Genesis 1.1, 1, 1, and uh, thus begins the story of creation and the history of humanity in the Old Testament. Um, two chapters later, Satan is deceived. Eve and Adam has sinned. How was it that Satan was able to tempt Eve? Well, Paul explains it in 2 Corinthians 11.13. Uh, where he writes, But I am afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, your minds will be led astray from the simplicity and purity of devotion to Christ. So, you know, if we look at the verse, a serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness. Uh, he's, he's, he's crafty. Um, and, and, you know, what's so crafty? Well, deception is pretty crafty. Um, deception is more devious than temptation. Um, and a- accusation, because when you're being tempted, you know it. You know, you, you have that ability to resist. You can feel the temptation. I shouldn't do this. And then you make that decision. <laughs> um, it, it might only take an instant um, to give in to temptation. Um, but you know you're being tempted. Um, when you're accused, uh, you certainly know it. That's when the enemy, you know, uh, Satan brings the condemnation and says, this guy isn't a Christian. This woman isn't a Christian. Look at how they act. Look at the way they think. They, they can't possibly be in God's good graces. Um, so, yeah, you know it when you're being accused. Um, but when you're deceived, you don't know it. If you did know it, you wouldn't be deceived, you know. Um, I, I knew he was. And although, in retrospect, a lot of us say, I knew he was lying. Well, if you knew he was lying, then, then, you, then you were tempted and decided to believe the lie. Um, but yeah, usually you don't know you're deceived. Um, you know, you might have suspected, but you, somewhere along the lines, you decided to believe the lie. Um, if we don't know the truth and we don't know our enemy, um, who he is, 
Um, we'll, be, we'll be like blindfolded children striking out at ourselves and each other, unaware that we are being deceived. You know, every moment by, every movement by God is countered by sa- Satan. Um, you know, there's always a counterfeit. Um, uh, well, you know, and, and thus the end times prophecy of a false prophet and uh, the Antichrist is sort of a, a pretty stark example of a counterfeit of the Christ. Um, so yeah, that's one example. Um, Matthew thirteen twenty four through twenty five, Jesus told the parable um, where he said, "The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while his men were sleeping, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went away." The wheat in this parable represents uh, the sons of God, and the the, the tares are the sons of the evil one. Tares and wheat look like look pretty much like the same thing. They look like blades of grass, and they're hard to tell apart from one another until harvest time, at the, when it's late in the season and there's a harvest. Um, the wheat will actually produce a you know a stalk of, of grain um, and uh, a head of grain, as they say. And uh, the tares that they don't bear any fruit. They just they don't do. The, the, just like sort of, and it's sort of a really great analogy if you if you never thought about that wheat and tares thing, because um, because the emphasis on that parable whenever we hear it in scripture is usually like oh they're gonna, they're gonna be in the same field and they're hard to tell from one another and at the end of the age they, they come and harvest harvest them they collect the wheat and they throw the tares into the fire um, you know as a as a sign of judgment. Um, but but in that you know in that illustration that um, uh, Anderson points out, the wheat produce fruit and the tares don't. And how do we know when someone's a Christian? Usually there should be some fruit. And uh, if there isn't fruit, um, it should make you suspect um, their faith may not be genuine. Um, like I said, we can't. And we're going to go into the, uh, a lot of the salvation, saved forever. Can you lose it? Can you, can you, you know, it all sort of comes up within the lesson and uh, I'll address that. But yeah, if you don't have fruit, you should worry. And, and scripture tells you to seek out your, your salvation with fear and trembling because there should be some sort of change when you come to Christ. And, but I'll give grace to the many because uh, there was no fruit in my life for a long time. Um, and some would say, where is it now? But anyway, um, you know, we're not fruit inspectors, uh, um, but, but that does sort of come up. And, and fruit, a genuine walk has fruit. Um, let's see. And the only defense against deception is to know the truth and to be spiritually discerning. That is why Jesus prayed to the Father in John 17, uh, 15 and 17, the high priestly prayer, as some people call it. Uh, I do not ask you to take them out of the world, but to keep them from the evil one. Verse 17 says, sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. So the word has the power to, you know, sanctify is to make holy or make, you know, clean. Um, So that word has the ability to make us clean. And I can tell you from studying it and being convicted by it, it, it caused me to repent of many things in my life. So I would say it's true. Um, uh, you don't have to go by me, though. That was Jesus saying those words. Uh, uh, Sanctify them in, in the truth. Your word is truth. That's Jesus Christ saying it. You don't have to say, oh, M.T. Clark, he said it, so I guess I'll believe it. No, no. Uh, we'll, go with, we'll stand on Jesus first and foremost. Um, the belt of truth, as they talk about in Ephesians 6:14, is the first piece of armor of God. And uh, Paul, um, and well, Paul spells that out, and all the different fruit that, uh, all the different pieces of armor that relate to our faith. But um, whenever I disciple anybody or, or or teach anyone about recovery or anything, uh, someone new to the faith coming in. Um, the first thing I try to impress on them is, well, I guess the second thing. The first thing I try to impress on them is seek the Lord. Um, is seek him and seek him continually. That's If I were to give one lesson, that would be the one. But if I were to give a second lesson, I would say, uh, you know, you're, you're following Jesus Christ. He's the way, the truth, and the life. So it's time to tell the truth. And, and that's what we have to stand on. Um, that's the first thing you should do as a Christian is stop lying. 
Um, uh, that's it. And guess what? There's great freedom in, in, not, in not lying anymore and telling the truth. So the belt of truth is you know, important. Um, obviously, the, the words can sanctify us. The word is true. So we should be people of the truth. Um, and I, I don't want to get into a debate about you know, situational ethics or anything like that. Um, and generally, um, you would tell the truth. And nine times out of ten, unless you were going to save someone's life through a lie, um, is, would be the rare exception, I would say. Um, and I'm sure we could come up with other hypothetical situations where you have to lie to, but we'll just leave that aside. But um, Paul used very specific words, uh, very specific language when he warned us about the end times. In 1 Timothy 4.1, he, he wrote, The Spirit clearly says that in latter times, later times, um, some will abandon the faith and follow deceiving spirits and things taught by demons. And, and that's one of those verses, you know, that says, wait a minute, he's going to abandon the faith? So what are the consequences there? Um, but the deal is, I mean, if they're following deceiving spirits, they're being deceived. But that's another, another verse that's out there where it's abandon the faith. Does that mean you can lose your salvation? Well, yeah, well, here's my take, <laughs> you know, um, he's going to abandon the faith. Well, there's two, two scenarios here. A, they weren't saved, see, because my, my stance is if you're saved, you're saved. And your fruit may grow much later in life. If you make that profession uh, of salvation in Christ, you're saved. And then you will be sanctified and, you know, uh, and move along the path. But... You know, time is a long thing between when we live and die. And there's a lot, you know, just because you see somebody today who is who is in sin doesn't mean they're not going to repent at a later date. We would encourage them to do it now. But, uh, but and so they could abandon their faith. Now, if they abandon their faith, that means, I would say, they go into sin, are deceived until they die and discover, you know, are, are given great, great mercy because they actually had faith. Whereas if they didn't have faith and they were able to walk away from it, that means they were never, they had a false confession. They were never a Christian. That's my take on it. Um, I like to walk, walk along the line, in, the, in between the lines and try to, you know, bridge all the gaps of, of all the different doctrines of theology that would tell you, tell you whatever. Because, you know, God knows the hearts of men and he knows who are his. And we can't make, you know, broad sweeping statements in regards to uh, salvation when it comes to individual people. Um, yeah, doctrinally or hypothetically, we can talk about uh, what the scripture indicates. But in the terms of this guy here or that girl there, uh, I'm not going to make the call on him. Um, I'm going to pray for him and tell him to repent because I was lost in sin for the first few years of, of my confession as a born again Christian. Um, so some might say, where's the fruit? I went to church regularly, but that was about it. Um, so grace and mercy. Um, anyway, sorry. Um, we are living in the age where evil men and imposters will proceed from bad to worse. You know, deceiving and being deceived. You know, right now we can't trust the media. The, the, manip the manipulation of information, both written and visual, has become so commonplace that what we, you see, hear, and read in the mainstream media cannot be trusted. Um, the technology is so advanced now that we can, they can even manufacture video images to, to make you believe something happened. So, wow, you know, um, we're in the age of deception and sin. Um, not that, the, you know, prior times, but now we have a great technology to make, make our sins even more convincing. Um, you know, there is no class of people harder to help than those who are self-deceived. Um, usually they don't ask for help because they perceive that there is nothing wrong with them, you know, and, and that they, they, they don't, they've done nothing wrong. And anyone who's tried to save, you know, speak the gospel to somebody and bring them to Christ knows they, they generally don't think they have a problem. There is no problem there at all. They're, they have a philosophy of life and they're going to live, die, and and not worry about the consequences. Um, they'll just assume they're saved because they're a body and they'll die and what'll, whatever will happen will happen. Um, God is good, so I'll just you know count God's goodness. Uh, uh, we'll really count on God's goodness because uh, His holiness is uh, you know is too scary to consider. 
Um, so, perfect example of people who deny they have a problem are alcoholics. Uh, as a former alcoholic, um, um, I would say, you know, well, you know, I always knew I had a problem, so I don't know about that. You know, whenever you said you didn't have a problem, it wasn't a problem to me, I guess, <laughs> um, except for when I had a hangover or, or whatever. But usually, you know, and 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 the illustration, you know, he says, I don't have a problem. I can believe I can quit any time I wanted. Well, when I was drinking, there was no way I wanted to quit. Um, so there was, you know, there was no there was no problem because uh, I, I wasn't going to try. Um, you know, so yeah, let's talk about denial. That's why recovery ministries. Um, will stage interventions, uh, hoping the alcoholic will acknowledge his or her problem uh, and seek treatment by bringing in um, their loved ones uh, to spell out, uh, you know, uh, you know what they've done and and how their drinking is a problem. Um, you know, self-deception may be accompanied by another culprit, though. Um, and notice in the passages, uh, in the following passages, how hardening our hearts and choosing not to believe make room for the devil. 2 Corinthians 4, 3 and 4 tells us, and even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are, who are perishing, and whose case the God, uh, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelieving so that they might not see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. Yeah, spiritually blinded. It's it's veiled. They can't see it. So when you you could you know you can do all the apologetics in the world. You can't stop spiritual blindness. Uh, what you can do is hope the Holy Spirit will bless your efforts, and uh, allow them t- to have that veil come 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 off, and so they can see the truth. Um, you know which which is the which, which came first, the blinding or the unbelieving? You know there's a veil over the hearts of those who have hardened their hearts. But whenever a person turns to the Lord, that veil's taken away. So there you go. You know, we can't make those easy calls. That guy's lost. Well, he's lost today. But, you know, next week he's going to run into somebody who's anointed by the Holy Spirit and he's going to be saved. Um, so, yeah, it's a, our lives are a fluid thing. They change from one moment to the next. And, and I'm not saying our, our status of salvation will change, except for when you go from lost to saved. Um, but uh, things can change. Can, people can repent. Um, but it's only possible through God. Uh, the word of the Lord came to Ezekiel, uh, speaking to him back in the day, saying, Son of man, you live, to the, uh, you live in the midst of a rebellious house who, who, have eyes, who have eyes to see but do not see, ears to hear but do not hear. And they are, are a rebellious house. You know, which came first, uh, the blinding or the rebellion? I think sometimes it's, you know, I think there's, a, there's two things. Because uh, when you're blind, you don't know you're being deceived. And you genuinely, when you're, when you're outside the faith, you genuinely don't want it. <laughs> um, so we don't really have to be deceived too much because we've decided uh, we're not part of the church. We're not going to be we're not going to be in that number when the saints go marching in. We don't care. We're going to be hanging in low places with all our friends in hell. Um, yeah, just like a country western song. Uh, it doesn't work that way. There's enough scripture to to make your blood curdle um, to tell you that hell's not not the place you want to go. And who told us that? Mostly Jesus. So you know, again, trust the source. Um, there's several ways we can be self-deceived, and I think we'll hit all of them. There's eight points, and we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna be able to raise our hand at almost every one of these. Um, the first one. Uh, uh, says we, we are deceiving ourselves if we hear or read God's word, but don't do what it says. I think everybody listening and everyone here could raise their hand to say that we've been deceived by that. James 1, 22 and through 24 tells us, but prove yourselves doer the words uh, of the word and not merely, merely hearers who delude themselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks at his natural face in the mirror. For once he has looked at himself and gone away, he has immediately forgotten what kind of a person he was. And that's it. I'm a Christian. I know. I know that. And then we do something different. We don't do what the word says. Um, you know, the 90-pound anorexic looks in the mirror and says, I'm fat. Um, the legalist reads Matthew 23, where Jesus denounced the scribes and the Pharisees, but they can't see that uh, that they are guilty of the same thing. Um, 
You know, they're no different from those scribes and Pharisees because they're standing on a law and not standing on the grace of God and, and Jesus Christ to, to save. They're, sta- they're standing on their own self-righteousness. Um, you know, Jesus said, if you know these things, you're blessed if you do that. You know, again, Christ calls us to obedience. And that was John 13, 17. Uh, the second way we deceive ourselves is John wrote that if, if we say that we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves and the truth is not in us. That's 1 John 1, 8. We are not sinless saints. We are saints who sin. The paradox again. Oh, no. Oh, so, and like I said, I think I, I talked, I know I talked about it on our uh, Bible study podcast last week and I might have spoke about it last, um, last week in class. You know, that 1 John 1, 8, People say, see, I'm a sinner. There's nothing I can do about it. So they use that verse to, to, you know, basically just remain in their sin and not try to repent, not try to uh, change. Um, the thing is, we're in a progressive relationship with the Lord. As we're growing, we can sin less and eventually maybe even say goodbye to some of our besetting sins if we trust the Lord. Um, that's living by faith. Um, you know, one of the things that gets twisted, um, certain, uh, certain sects of, of Christianity, certain denominations believe in holiness. Um, they sort of strive for a sinless perfection, um, which is awesome. I think that's great. But the thing is that to attain it, which some have claimed to do, um, that's where we fall into. There's your sin. You're just, you're, you're deceived yourself that you have no sin. Um, you know, Jesus Christ was without sin. So not only we, do we have to abstain from certain, you know, sins from the law, we also have to do everything right, uh, you know. Otherwise, we're missing the mark, you know. That's, the, that's another thing. Uh, we did a study on sin at our Bible study last week, and one of the definitions for sin is missing the mark. And, and I love to point out that it just means you're not doing everything right. It doesn't mean it's not a codified law system like a penal, penal uh, you know, penal code. Um, there's... there's what God would do. There's the good, perfect will, you know, good, uh, better, and <laughs> perfect will of God uh, for Romans. And uh, if you're not meeting it, you're, you're sinning. And I would say, you know, we could extend that out to uh, the use and abuse of our bodies, um, you know, the, the stewardship of, our, of the things we have. Um, there's all kinds of ways we can miss the mark that, that you know, that we can do better in. Um, but... Some, like I said, uh, I don't want to name names, but some denominations believe that you could get that, and some people have actually claimed they don't, they've had sinless perfection, which is, a, you know, unfortunately a lie. Um, but they, if they're saying it, they mean it, and that means they're deceived. Thus, the second way you can be deceived is say you have, have no sin. Um, the moment we become aware of our sin, we should confess it, and that's not just saying I'm sorry. Um, true confessors don't just say I'm sorry. They, they say, I did it. And not only do they say they did it, uh, to confess means to agree with God. It is the same as walking in the light. Uh, that is consciously living in a moral agreement with the Lord. Um, the, you know, the consequences of agreeing with the Lord is repentance. You know, I agree with you, Lord, that's wrong. So thus, I will not do that anymore. Um, please help me. Help me change. Ephesians 4, 25 through 27 says, Therefore, laying aside falsehood, speak truth to each one of you with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. Be angry, and yet do not sin. Uh, do not let the sun go down on your anger, and do not let, give the devil an, an opportunity. You know, the Greek word there uh, that's translated in this version of the Bible as, as opportunity is more commonly translated as place or room. So don't give the devil a place in your life, you know. Um, how do we give the devil a place in our lives? Well, sin is the big obvious one, um, you know, when you're being... Uh, when you're being a rebel against God, Satan's right there with you, uh, cheering you on. You know, when, um, if you're unforgiving, you know, God commands us to forgive one another. Um, if we're unforgiving and bitter, uh, Satan's right there with you too. He loves to keep you unhappy. Um, but other ways he can trip you up, and, I, and I've been feeling this more in my spirit as, as, as I walk, is, is whenever I watch something that I shouldn't be watching, even if it's not blatantly, um, you know, Although most of the stuff I, I, I 
I watch that, that I feel bad about is blatant. Uh, I shouldn't be watching this. Um, not necessarily, you know, anything uh, too risque or anything, but uh, the content just is not wholesome. Um, they might highlight murder and killing or something. And, uh, you know, after you watch it, you go, geez, I don't feel so great about that. And I think the devil can take a, you know, have a, have a place in your, your you know, get, get some room in your life when you open yourself up to stuff. Um, like I said, you could, uh, I, uh, earlier this week, I had a couple bad dreams and I'm like, I think this is in direct relation to what I've been watching. Even though the, even though the, the images in the dreams didn't match up with what I watched, I think I made a place for, uh, some torment because, because I opened myself up to seeing something. Um, and unbelief is the way we open ourselves up. If we don't believe God is who he says he is in the total way he says he is, we're leaving little places where we, we lack faith, and that would be beliefs of our unbelief and attitudes. Um, you know, you don't believe in God's ability to heal. Um, wow, it's, you know, your trust isn't there. Um, I've been recently convicted because, because I've, uh, I've been listening to uh, Eric, Eric Metaxic's um, audio book on miracles and it's just this it's an astounding um an astounding book uh that really can give you faith for for what god can do in this world and you can disbelieve um all these things but the the author basically only used uh miracles of people he he knew and uh that and these things have been documented and testified to and uh you know, it was it was really it's really something. It's it, it, it's a really great book, and I I'll put that on the uh, the blog as a resource tonight for people to check out because it is just fabulous. Um, it's even better when you don't have to read the book and it's just read to you via audio book. Uh, really, it really chokes you up. Um, the third way, sorry, uh, the third way we uh, um, deceive ourselves is if we believe that we are someone other than who we really are. Um, Galatians 6.3 says, For if anyone thinks he is something that when, when he is nothing, he deceives himself. Um, uh, Romans 12.3 says, For through the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think more highly of himself than he ought to think, but to think so as to have sound judgment, as God has allowed it uh, to each of us a measure of faith. You know, um, uh, Anderson says, you have sound judgment if you say, I know who I am, I am a child of God, seated with Christ in the heavenlies, and I can do all things through him who strengthens me. By contrast, a phony deceives himself and lacks sound judgment. And, you know, a phony, you know, and, and here's where self-deception can really come in, especially if you walk in charismatic circles like I do, where we, where we uh, experience gifts of the Spirit and we, and we, and we speak about uh, the gifts of the Spirit, well, we know it's possible, um, but, you know, uh, for a while there, I thought I was a prophet. Uh, so, you know, whether I am or not, because of certain dreams or visions or whatever I, I saw. But um, the thing with me, I, I would always run into dead ends. So I know I'm not a prophet. The stuff I thought was going to happen didn't happen. Dreams, uh, dreams I got didn't come true. And... Yeah, I'm, I'm willing to wait and say maybe they will come true someday, but we have to be grounded in the truth. And when something is not confirmed, we got to step back and, and say, uh, you know what, um, I'm not, maybe I'm not all that in a bag of chips in, in the spiritual realm, and I'm just going to be humble and follow the Lord and uh, try to relax. So, you know, don't think more of yourself than you really are. Uh, be a humble child of God and... Uh, Trust him to bring you where you want to go. Uh, the fourth way we can deceive ourselves is, um, let's see, if we possess worldly wisdom yet lack an eternal perspective. First Corinthians three eighteen and nineteen t- tells us, "Let no man deceive himself. If any man among you thinks that he is wise in this age, he must become foolish, so that he may become wise. For the wisdom of the world is foolishness before God. For it is written." He is the one who catches the wise in their craftiness. Um, you know, that's worldly. You know, there's a lot of smart people in the world. A lot of smart people deny Jesus. Um, so it doesn't matter how smart you are. 
Um, you can be the most brilliant person in any field uh, of science or any individual study, um, but if you don't know uh, Jesus Christ, you 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 are foolish. Um, your your entire existence will be uh, for naught, and there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth in your future. Um, and and to just not investigate your faith. Um, you know, you're foolish. Now, granted, you're spiritually blind, so we, we feel bad. Um, but yeah, if you have wisdom and you don't have an eternal perspective, are only concerned with this world, um, there's a problem. You're, you're being deceived. Knowledgeable people um, may seem wise for, uh, from a temporal perspective, but true wisdom is seeing life from God's eternal perspective. And, and that's it. You want that veil torn off? You've got to take God's perspective. Uh, you know, play devil's, here we go, play devil's advocate by believing God um, and trusting what he says. Uh, test that knowledge. Test God's knowledge. And uh, try to see the world from his perspective, because that's when the veil comes off, when we start to examine our existence and realize, wait, I am going to die. I'm not going to live forever. What's going to happen next? You know, that existential dread um, will, will draw you to God. And as scripture says, if you seek him, you will find him. Um, I, I looked, uh, <laughs> you know, in my, in my personal history, I looked all over the place. Um, uh, Catholicism convicted me of my sins, so I decided uh, I'd be, be better off a, an atheist because there was no way I could change. Um, atheism was sort of a bummer uh, because it just meant your, your, your existence was meaningless, so I, I settled for Episcopalianism, um, which was like Catholic light, which is much nicer. Um, but when a personal tragedy came along, my faith was shallow um, so or non-existent. Um, I'd say shallow. I don't know. You know, the, the, the continuum of my faith, who knows? Maybe I was saved at First Communion and I just didn't know it. And I was walking in sin all those years. And then that day in 2010 when I said yes to Jesus, that's when we came into, you know, full, full fruition of my faith. Um, yeah, who's to say? Um, but, but I know now for sure. Um, you know, you don't teach a class on spiritual warfare uh, uh, without, uh, without believing. Um, that Jesus Christ is is Lord, and that uh, the the forces of darkness are out there to be opposed. Um, let's see. Uh, the f- the fifth way uh, we we deceive ourselves is if we think we are mature but can't control what we say. Uh, James one twenty six says, if anyone thinks himself to be religious and yet does not bridle his tongue but deceives his own heart, this man's religion is worthless. Uh, Ephesians 4, 29 and, 20, and 30 is another reference they give for that. Um, yeah, if you can't control your tongue, guess what? That's, 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 that's not the end of the world. you got there's something to work on. You, you slayed all those other sins, but you still snap off occasionally verbally. Well, now it's time to work on that. Um, yeah, and if you think you're... Right. If you don't have control in the area of your life and you think you're mature, guess what? You need to mature more. It's very simple. Um, the sixth way we deceive ourselves is if uh, if we think we will face no consequences for our behavior. Um, Galatians 6, 7 says, Do not be, be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, this he will also reap. Like I uh, you know, if you wanted to believe in karma, there you go. You reap what you sow. Um, but let's let's just lose the term karma and instead say Galatians 6, 7. Uh, we are forgiven, but if we still must live, we still must live with the consequences of our thoughts, words, and actions, whether good or bad. So yeah, just because we put on Christ doesn't mean we put on a bulletproof vest that we can sin. Uh, without impunity and uh, suffer no ill consequences. Romans 6, uh, 6.23 tells us the, the wages of sin is death. Now, yes, that means eternal you know, separation uh, from the Lord uh, if you don't have Christ as your Savior. But, you know, that death, uh, you know, you can feel like death warmed over uh, if you're a Christian lost in sin. Um, and... The seventh way we deceive ourselves if we believe that the unrighteous will inherit the, the kingdom of God. Um, this, the, you know, this is one of those convicting sections of scripture. It's 1 Corinthians 6, 9, and 10. Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? 
Do not be deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor homosexuals, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. Um, Anderson writes that the the liberal church is deceived when they anoint a practicing homosexual to be a bishop or perform same-sex marriages. A revivalist in Florida was casting out demons and healing in Jesus' name, but afterward he abruptly left the revival to live with a woman who was not his wife. The Lord warned us of such people in Matthew 7.23, And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. And, you know, that's the scary, these are the scariest verses in the Bible. Um, uh, you know, the 723 from Matthew, you know, depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Before that, um, you know, Jesus says that these people are, are calling out, Lord, Lord, we did all these wonderful things in your in your name. And they they were they were wrong because they were practicing lawlessness. They thought they were covered by the blood of Christ. But there was no there was no no, you know. There was no change. There was no no call to repentance. And that's why, you know, I'm here today teaching is because verses like 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 10, um, you know, basically spelled out drunk, drunkards, you know, would, would not make it among the other things that I was guilty of on that list that we won't go into. Um, but, um, yeah, the, these, these things call us to repentance. In fact, in my testimony, I remember specifically an, a, an episode on Christian television of uh, The Way of the Master with Ray, Ray Comfort and uh, Kirk Cameron, um, where they go and evangelize people. And the episode that, that I really didn't like was the one they did on drunkenness. And uh, it, they pointed out this verse and I was, uh, you know, I was, I was saved by grace and living it up in sin, uh, living it up in drunkenness. And I saw that, I saw that, and I was like, "Are you kidding me? I thought I was forgiven." And uh, you know, you see these things, and you're like, "Whoa, I got to change," or, or you know, or maybe you know, or suffer and, and roll the dice. Am I saved or not? You know, um, if I'm living in sin, I, I, I don't have any assurance of my salvation. Um, you know, I, I have to stand on those promises and then ignore the rest of Scripture. Like, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, the, uh, he's not calling us to repent just to be saved. That's all. No, he's, he's one of the first things Jesus says in one of the synoptic Gospels is, you know, repent um, for the kingdom of God is in hand. You know, he wants you to change, too. Um, so, and like I said, you know, in our lives, so you'd be like, well, he's a drunk. He says he's a Christian, but he's a drunk. So he's not a Christian. He's going to go to hell. You know, we don't we don't know. He could be he could be one of the people saying law, you know, Lord, Lord. And Jesus says, depart from me. I never knew you. Um, Or he could be like, you know, my grace is sufficient for you and you're going to be forgiven regardless. Uh, But we're we're making the we're making the very clear distinction here today that, um, you know, we should not be deceived that um, we're called to repentance. And I would not want to. Uh, for myself, I you know I loved I loved my drunken lifestyle for most of my life. Uh, to change was certainly an act of faith, um, and what and it was driven by my my desire to to be an authentic Christian, to to follow and and have that assurance of of my covenant relationship with the Lord. So don't be deceived if you're sinning like any. And guess what? That's not you know. A lot of people point out, oh, that's oh, they're they're ba- they're ba- banging on the homosexuals there. They're 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 hateful or whatever. Well, guess what? These sins cover everybody. Um, we're all called to repentance, and so one sin isn't worse than the others. Uh, we all need to change, um, but we shouldn't be deceived. You know, if we're living in, in a sinful lifestyle, we should be concerned. But there's grace, so go to the Lord and 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 ask Him to help you. Um, the eighth and final way, not probably not the final way we're deceived, but the final one of the lesson, uh, is if we are deceived if we think we are incorruptible when we associate with the wrong crowd. You know, uh, 1 Corinthians 15.33 tells us, do not be deceived. Bad company corrupts good morals. Um, you know, Anderson, well, I mean, basically on that last point, yeah, you... 
if you had a problem like me, like, well, like most alcohol, uh, former alcoholics, if you have a problem drinking, you probably should avoid um, hanging out with your old drinking buddies or your old drug, drug using friends um, and avoid that because you probably will fall into sin if your faith is not strong. Um, I can testify that uh, I have been tested and I have passed the test. And I don't, I honestly, I don't believe in, you know, labeling my, I say former alcoholic because I'm not going to label myself as an alcoholic. I believe I've been delivered um, from my problems with alcohol and it's been tested and, and that deliverance came through my faith in Jesus Christ. And I've been out on several occasions now with drinking friends, dancing and, 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 and everything else. And I've had no temptation to drink um, because my my uh, my allegiance is to Christ, and I don't want anything to get in the way of that. And I don't want, including me, going out to a place where I could represent uh, Christ um, and, and encourage people um, to come to faith. Um, Anderson shares a story of uh, in his book. He shares a story of Alvin, <laughs> Alvin and the Chipmunks. No. Not Alvin and the Chipmunks. Alvin apparently was a, a prophet, right? You know, he had these you know, prophetic gifts. Uh, he believed he had a spiritual gift from God. He was invited by several churches to share his prophetic messages. Then his per- personal life began to fall apart. Alvin uh, reached the point where he could no longer function in society, so he completely withdrew from people. By the time he came to see Anderson, he was unemployed, heavily medicated, and being cared for by his father. Um, After a lengthy discussion about false prophets and teachers, um, Alvin said that he thought his problems began when he failed to to test the gifts of tongues and prophecy conferred on him by what he now knew to be false teachers. Not only was he deceived, but he deceived others. Anderson and Alvin uh, agreed to test his gift of tongues. As Alvin prayed in tongues, Anderson prayed by the authority given in to him in Christ for whatever spirit that was speaking to identify itself. Alvin's demeanor changed and he said, I am he. Um, when Anderson asked if the spirit was Christ, the Christ who was crucified under Pontius Pilate, buried, uh, raised on the third day, and who now sits at the right hand of the Father, he res- uh, Alvin, the voice and Alvin responded emphatically, no, not he. It obviously wasn't the spirit uh, from the spirit of God. Um, you know, before you get to the wrong conclusion about what what was happening here, remember Paul's instruction uh, for 1 Corinthians fourteen thirty nine: desire earnestly to prophesy and do not forbid to speak in tongues. So, you know, even Anderson, who's pretty conservative, is saying that prophecy and the gift of tongues um, is something um, is our authentic gifts of the spirit. Um, however, uh, because of Alvin's situation, he's, he's telling us that if we're zealous for spiritual gifts, we must be equally willing to submit, uh, submit spiritual manifestations to God. You know, yes, we are to acknowledge the reality of the supernatural, but we are also to be certain of their origin, you know. Um, and that's where this fruit testing will come in. Um, 1 Thess- Thessalonians 5:19-22 tells us, do not quench the spirit, do not despise prophetic utterances, but examine everything carefully, hold fast to that which is good, abstain from every form of evil. You know, some people talk about their relationship with, with, with the Holy Spirit and how, it, how sin, uh, they sinned and basically they quenched the spirit and the spirit was gone from them and, and, and they think it's gone. Well, I would point out these verses here and say, well, it says abstain from every form of evil. So you have to repent of your sin. Um, otherwise, you will quench the spirit. Because these verses here, we could say, well, I despise pro- prophecies. When, you know, you're know, you quenching the spirit if you do that. Well, I, I like to point out that it's the, the forms of evil that are, are, are the things to really be abstained from. Um, you know, taking, let's see... Now, false prophets and teachers flourish now, uh, as they did back in the day, uh, simply because Christians accept their ministry without exercising spiritual discernment. You know, there's all the, every church scandal. You know, somebody was uh, 
was was doing something and uh, they weren't held accountable. Um, and, and and what happened? They they just let them. They were deceived. They didn't they didn't discern what they were doing. You know, we have to com- we have to compare. Uh, you know, in terms of gifts, we have to compare the counterfeit with the real. Every true prophet of God in the Old Testament was essentially an evangelist. You know, a prophet draws people back to God and his word. You know, the call to righteousness was the standard that separated the genuine prophet from the false. And Jeremiah wrote in uh, 23, 16 and 21, 22, Thus says the Lord of hosts, do not listen to the words of the prophets who are, prophes- who are prophesying to you. I did not send these prophets, but they ran. I did not speak to them, but they prophesied. But if they had stood in my counsel, then they would have announced my words to my people. It would have turned them back from their evil way and from the evil of their deeds. Jeremiah continued in 23, 25, and 28. I have heard what the prophets have said who prophesy falsely in my name, saying, I had a dream, I had a dream. The prophet who has a dream may relate his dream, but let him who has my word speak my word in truth. What the straw have in common with grain, declares the Lord. You know, God did communicate through dreams, and he does communicate in dreams. The Eric Metaxas book, uh, Eric Metaxas himself uh, had a dream of, uh, dream that led him to Jesus Christ. Uh, Nabil Qureshi, um, who is a uh, was a, a Muslim, uh, no longer with us, but he had a dream. He had a, a couple dreams in his in his investigation of the Christian faith that led him to Christ, and he wrote the book Seeking Allah, Finding Jesus, um, before he passed away. And uh, and I recommend that book to anybody who's interested in Islam and to see you know what how you know if anyone's in Islam and wants to see. How Nabil Qureshi became a Christian. His his uh, his book is awesome um, because it, it it exposes the lies of of the Islamic faith and uh, and how someone who was deeply in love with the Islamic religion um, saw the truth and turned to Jesus. Um, God did communicate through dreams, of course, uh, like I said, and He still does. But if 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 you know, but but compared to God's word. Um, dreams are mere straw, as uh, God made the, the analogy. Uh, if, if the only food we give cattle is straw, they'll die. They will sleep on it, but they won't eat it because it has no nutrients. So share your dreams, but don't equate them with God's word. And don't make them the basis of your faith. Um, yeah. It's, it's, as we will have experiences of faith in the Lord, we'll have manifestations of the Spirit, um, we shouldn't trust in the experiences alone as the basis of our faith. The basis of our faith should be uh, the Word of God and our trust in Jesus Christ. Um, Jeremiah 23, 29 says, Is not my word like fire, declares the Lord, and like a hammer which shatters a rock? Uh, I wouldn't expect prophecies like "I love you, chil- my children," or "I'm coming soon." If members of the congregation are living in sin, uh, although such statements are true, uh, and those who know Scripture should already know that, you know, the Spirit of God is not going to lull His people into an unrighteous complacency. Remember, God uh, begins in the household of God. Uh, a, a judgment begins in the household of God. He's He's here to, you know, conform us to the image of Christ. A prophetic message should motivate people to righteousness, not placate them in their sin. According to Paul, the gift of prophecy will disclose the secrets of a person's heart, uh, causing him to fall on his face and worship God. God is more concerned about church purity than about church growth, because church purity is an essential prerequisite for church growth. Mm Most of the revivals in history have started with prayer, people wanting to turn to the Lord in prayer, and they repent, and, and thus they become pure, and then next thing you know, there's growth. Um, comfort comes to those who are suffering and persecuted for righteousness' sake. A comfort, comfortable churches, on the other hand, lead to colorless conform, conformity. Uh, 
Jeremiah continues his exposure of false prophets uh, prophets in uh, Jeremiah 23, 30 and 31. He says, therefore, be, therefore, behold, I am against the prophets, declares the Lord, who steal my words from each other. Behold, I am against the prophets, declares the Lord, who use their tongues and declare the Lord declare the Lord declares. You know, taking what God uh, God gave someone else and using it as your own uh, is plagiarism, um, and declaring that your words are not direct uh, words are directly from the Lord when they aren't is deceiving, and is an offense to God. You know, manipulating people by claiming to, to uh, claiming a word from the Lord is spiritual abuse. And last week we talked about uh, Ravi Zacharias, um, who had a sexual scandal, and you know it came out in the investigation afterwards that um, you know basically he's he more or less told the, the the women that were he was involved with that he was a special man of God and he was anointed and what they were doing weren't sin and what she was doing was service to the Lord. Um, uh, so yeah, manipulating people, uh, saying I got a word from God to tell you to do this or that. Uh, that's not good. That's spiritual abuse. Um, a lady actually uh, said to Anderson at one of his conferences, he said, oh, the Lord told me that you were supposed to do such and such. Uh, as kindly as he could, Anderson replied, no, I don't think he did. Um, if God had wanted Anderson to do something specific, why hadn't his, his, his Holy Spirit um, guided him as, pro- uh, as promised? No Christian is ever called to function as a medium. Uh, a prophetic message would call us to get right with God so he could guide us. Um, when a true prophet claims what will happen in the future, it always comes to pass. And that's 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 it, right, guys? I mean, um, I'm a prophet, and so what I say is going to happen. If it doesn't happen, guess what? You're not a prophet. So guess how I determined I wasn't a prophet? When I had dreams and the dreams didn't come true. When I saw visions and, and that were going to lead to a certain thing and guess what didn't happen. Um, I could persist in my belief that I'm a prophet or I could accept the fact that it's not true. Um, stop the self-deception, walk in the truth, and, uh, and you'll go far. A false prophet is exposed when his prophecies don't come true. You know, Moses instructed us not to believe the prophet whose prophecies fail. That's Deuteronomy 18.22. Uh, Deuteronomy 13.3, uh, 1 through 3 says, If a prophet or a dreamer of dreams arises among you and gives you a sign or a wonder, and the sign or wonder comes true concerning which you spoke, uh, spoke to you, uh, saying, Let us uh, go after other gods whom you have not known, and let us serve them, you shall not listen to the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams, for the Lord your God is testing you uh, to find out if you love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. So there's the flip side. Um, you know, a dream or a prophecy comes true, but the guy's basically telling you to walk away from the Lord, do things that aren't consistent with the word of God. And what do you do? Well, you're not supposed to follow. <laughs> the Lord's testing you. The Lord, the Lord gives all spiritual power. You know, He allows things to happen. Um, so yes, yeah, Satan has has the ability to do stuff too. Um, why why would God allow him to do that? To test us, as it says. Not every miraculous manifestation is from God. Satan can also perform signs and wonders, and he does so to direct our worship away from God to himself. God can use signs and wonders to confirm the word, but the Bible also warns that in Mark 13, 22, false Christs and false prophets will arise and will show signs and wonders in order to lead astray, if possible, the elect, us. Uh, Deuteronomy 13, 5 through 11 tells us, uh, reveals the seriousness of it, attributing uh, to God the activity of Satan. Persons who mislead a, lead in this way were to be executed, even if they were your relatives. Every use of the word sign or wonder, either together or separate, in the context of Christ's second coming, is associated with a false prophet, a false teacher, or false messiah. God may perform signs and wonders today, but so does Satan. So, like I said, if we believe in the gifts of the Spirit, we have to be discerning. Uh, to, to know where they're coming from. The Apostle uh, Peter devoted an entire chapter in one of his letters to warning, warning about false prophets and teachers who operate within the church. 
2 Peter 2, 1 and 2 tells us, but false prophets also arose among the people, just as there will also be false teachers among you, who will secretly introduce destructive heresies, even denying the master who brought, who bought them, uh, bringing swift destruction upon themselves when they followed their sensuality. And because of them, the way of the truth will be maligned. Yeah, so there, I mean, right there, the sensuality. Oh, yeah, yeah uh, Jesus said this is all right. Um, no, no, he didn't. You know, he doesn't want you to leave someone in the sin. Um, and, and I mean, that's that's Robbie Zacharias right there. Sorry, Robbie. Um, uh, but yeah, um, you know, basically saying, uh, you know, if you're if you're going into lustly uh, or sins of the flesh, and claiming to be, you know, approved by God, and that's and I don't mean to just beat up on Robbie Zacharias. I mean, almost every pastor or evangelist that has fallen into a sexual scandal had a similar cop out where you know that they that they, they deserved it uh, because of their service to the Lord. Um, I won't name names because I I'm not I don't have the testimony in front of me, um, but yeah I recall like you know the stuff coming out uh, from different things in the past where it, the same types of uh, spiritual abuse was happening. Uh, notice how false teachers lure you into their deceptive teaching. Uh, the deceived follow their sensuality when they elevate appearance, performance, charm, and personality above the truth. Oh, he's such a nice guy. She's a very charismatic person. He's a real dynamic speaker. You know, uh, she's so sweet and sounds so sincere. But being physically attractive and having a charismatic personality are not the biblical criteria for validating a ministry or a teacher. Uh, the standards of tru- are truth and righteousness, and false teachers and malign both. Um, yeah, in terms of teachers, Paul Paul taught in the book of Acts and uh, to the point uh, so so charismatically that somebody fell asleep and fell out the window and died. Um, so you, know, you don't have to be a charismatic speaker um, uh, to to be a servant of the Lord. You know, uh, Peter revealed two ways by which we can identify false prophets and teachers who operate within the church. The first one is they indulge the, the, the flesh and its corrupt desires, sensuality. Uh, their immorality may not be easy to spot at first, but eventually it will surface. Their preaching will be lawless, you know, uh, overly emphasizing God's love and grace uh, while ignoring the call to be holy, like the Holy One. Um, yeah, like I said, God forgive, God will forgive us. It's okay. Like, yeah, God doesn't want you to do that. Um, yeah. The second thing is false prophets and teachers despise authority, you know, and are, are daring and self-willed. They have an independent spirit and they do their own thing and refuse to be accountable to anybody. Uh, you know, that was, a, again, with Robbie Zacharias, that was the thing that came out is, is uh, he wasn't really accountable um, to anybody. And he went all over the world um, uh, uh, by himself, you know, to... To other nations, so we, we probably only know the tip of the iceberg of uh, what happened in his life. There are three Old Testament leadership roles uh, that function, uh, that have a functional equivalence in the church. The prophet, uh, basically nowadays, uh, preaching and teaching. Um, and that's it too. And, and one of the, one of the, the modern spins or new, of a New Testament prophet is somebody who encourages, exhorts, and uh, edifies. That means a teacher, you know. Um, it's it's it, the, the the modern teaching on prophecy is basically not foretelling as the Old Testament prophets, or as much as forthtelling is what they say. Um, whereas we encourage someone. But the thing I, I run into, I, got, I run into a problem with that because it's, you know, you hear the phrase, you know in part and you prophesy in part. It's, it leaves a lot, it leaves a door open for a lot of, you know, uh, error. Um, and uh, it, it, it's difficult to discern, you know. Um, like I said, I myself was convinced that I was being led into the prophetic and at times I saw things or whatever that did come to pass. Um, but I wasn't, believe me, I didn't get on television or, you know, on the internet and tell everybody my prophecies, um, because I wanted to test things and see how they went. 
Um, I haven't lost my faith, um, but uh, I, I want to discern the truth from uh, deception. Um, you know, uh, the second second office is the priest. Uh, that's for pastor, pastoring and shepherding. You know, a church. Uh, and the last office is a king. They think of that as administration, someone leading the ministry. Uh, only Jesus and his perfection can fulfill all three roles simultaneously. Uh, plurality of elders in, in the church are, are, is needed to create a system of checks and balances so that the three critical roles can be delegated to more than one person. You know, that's usually why they have a board of elders, like in our church here. Um, there's more, you know, everyone comes together and they meet and they talk about the things that have to happen at the church and, uh, you know, what's going to be preached about and, and, all, and taught about and what services we're going to do and how it all comes together. So the, the elders come together and not only do they worry about the, the, the operation of the church, but they also check each other personally, you know, so know what's going on in each other's lives. They're, they hold each, They hold each other accountable. Um, for how they're living, and you know, it's not just business. Um, as we all know, absolute authority corrupts absolutely. And locally, there was a pre, uh, there was a a, a, ba- uh, a, a Baptist uh, minister apparently who was the head man of his church, and um, the head man had something to do with his head secretary um, because he didn't have any. And he, and he was caught in his sin, and because he was the head man, it was just sort of like, you know, he just he, he had he had to more or less decide for himself that he was he had to take a break or whatever, because he was he had too much authority, absolute power corrupts absolutely. Um, committed Christians in leadership roles need to submit themselves and their ideas to other mature believers who will hold them accountable. You know, so if your pastor is not accountable to others or he doesn't display the heart of a shepherd and a servant, you need to go to another church. You know, you, you don't want a dictator. Um, and we need to be, obviously, we in this class, obviously, we teach about being uh, aware of deceiving spirits. The Bible cautions us to test the spirits so that we can unmask the many antichrists that work in this world and distinguish the tr- spirit of truth uh, from the spirit of error. You know, Satan's demonic forces are at work attempting to pollute our minds with lies to keep us from walking in the truth. Regarding deceiving spirits, Hannah Withall Smith famously wrote, there, these, there are the voices of evil and deceiving spirits who lie in wait to entrap every traveler entering these higher regions of spiritual life, Christianity. In the same epistle that tells us that we are seated in the heavenly places in Christ, we are also told that we shall have to fight with spiritual enemies. These spiritual enemies, who, whoever and whatever they may be, must necessarily communicate with us by means by, of our spiritual faculties. And their voices, as the, as the voice of God, are an inward impression made upon our spirit. Therefore, just as the Holy Spirit may tell us by impressions what the will of, the, of God is concerning us, so also will these spiritual enemies tell us by impression what is their uh, their will concerning us? Though not, of course, giving it their na- uh, you know giving their name. You know they're gonna and like I said that what she's talking about there is the as we've as as I've taught about in class the Holy Spirit speaks to speaks to us uh, three ways. Uh, he communicates with us in worship, um, you know, in communion, as we say. Um, and he speaks to us in uh, our consciences, convicting us of our sins, and through intuition, uh, leading us to do things. So you get these leadings to do things. Um, unfortunately, like I, I said in my case, you, you leave, the, the enemy speaks to us in impressions too. And if you don't believe that's true, recall any time you were tempted. Did you feel like there was something, you know, it's sort of like you're being talked into something. Um, that's an impression upon your spirit. You know, that's that's the way temptation works. Like, hey, do this. Okay, wait, where'd that come from? I didn't want to do that. And then there's all this regret later. But you gave in um, to a deceiving spirit. Um, in your intuition, or your, you know, as she says, your the impression 
made on their spiritual faculties. Um, so yeah, we have to be discerning. We can't just go by that. See, that's that's the danger of just going with our feelings. Well, I got this feeling to do this. Well, does it line up with the Word of God? Uh, it might not. And if that's the case, we're being deceived. If you have any questions about the origin of certain mental impressions, the validity of spiritual gifts, or the credibility of those who speak for God, um, you know, we encourage you to p- petition God with the following prayer. Anderson gives this prayer in the book. Um, I'll read it out. Dear Heavenly Father, I commit myself unreservedly to you. I desire to know you and do you, uh, know and to do your will. I ask you to show me the true nature of this spirit, gift, or of this person claiming to be hearing from you. If I have been deceived in any way, I pray that you will open my eyes to the deception, Lord. If these impressions or gifts are from you, or if this person is sent by you, I gladly receive the message that I may grow and be edified by it. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. And he says we should also make a declaration. Um, the declaration he gives is, it says, Now in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, and by his authority, I command all deceiving spirits to depart from me, and I renounce and reject all counterfeit gifts and all other spiritual manifestations that are not from God. Um, and, and, you know, the spirit realms, it's a scary thing. You know, the fear of the Lord is, you know, he's, he, you know people would throw themselves on their face when the Lord was in their presence. Um, when, I, when I got baptized in the Holy Spirit, um, I was terrified uh, for a few moments before I realized it. And I literally said, if this is any spirit other than God, I cast you out in the name of Jesus Christ. <laughs> um, just to, because it was a stark manifestation of a spiritual, uh, sp- spiritual presence in, in, in my presence. And it was like, you know, you look over your shoulder and you don't see anything, but you know you're not alone. And uh, like I said, in my fear, I, I, I called on the name of Jesus Christ to cast out anything that was there. But as soon as I, I, I did that, you know, uh, this, uh, the Holy Spirit came over me, and it was just a feeling of unbelievable joy and love. And, uh, and I knew. And I was like, okay. And it was, uh, and, 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 and I had, and it it wasn't just one time. Um, I've had had that experience several times, and uh, if, I would say, and my, that's why my first lesson is seek the Lord, um, because if you want to seek Him, He will He will make Himself known, and sometimes it's with what people call the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Um, boy, oh boy! Um, but uh, like I said, and and talk about a game changer. I mean, that was it. How did how did MT? get baptized in the Holy Spirit. Here's my recipe if you want it. Um, you know, basically I went to Bible college. I was pursuing the Lord's word. Um, and then what the real kicker was, I turned from my sin. Um, I got baptized in the, in the Spirit basically a couple weeks after I, I went to recovery. Uh, when I was in the spirit of repentance, turning away from all the stuff I've ever done. Um, and I called out in prayer and, uh, and, and sought it. And, um, I received it. So, and and that's pretty much a standard recipe that you'll find amongst the literature of finding, you know, seeking the, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. It's, uh, you know, repentance. Um, will it, and trust in, you know, whatever. But, you know, read, read, read the stuff up. Um, <laughs> um, but, yeah, if, if you want an experience, um, it's time to surrender more of yourself and get into the word of God and to seek him and, uh, and seek him in worship and prayer. Um, all of the above, you know, if you seek him, you will find it. Uh, spiritual discernment is our God given early warning system that lets us know something is wrong in the spiritual realm, even though nothing appears wrong in the natural realm. The Holy spirit indwells every believer. So guess what? You already got him. He's already there. As soon as you said yes to Jesus Christ, he's in there. He, and he's the one bringing you to repentance. If he, he manifests you know, in your life in a, in a more dramatic way than just in your conscience, great. But guess what? Even the most humdrum Christian has got the Holy Spirit. So, you know, second blessing, whatever. Um, he, you, everyone's got the Holy Spirit. You know, 
it, what, what you might not have is repentance. Um, that's what you might need to seek. Um, and you know, faith, trust, belief. If you believe it, you'll receive it. You know, these are, that's how we live by faith. Walking in the power of the Holy Spirit is, is we believe we've been set free, and then we walk in it as if it's true, because it is true. Um, these are the things we need to do. Um, you know, motive plays a big role in developing a spiritual discernment. First um, Kings three nine. So, so give the you know Solomon prayed. So give your servant an understanding heart to judge your people uh, to discern between good and evil. You know Solomon might have ended badly because uh, absolute power absolutely corrupts, um, and having a thousand wives probably doesn't help. Um, <laughs> but but he started good. He wanted to do right by the Lord. His prayer was sincere. You know, God rewarded Solomon for his humble request by making him the wisest man alive. And the motive for true discernment is never self-promotion. No, I, yeah, well, like, yeah, I was seeking the Lord. I wasn't trying to become powerful or anything. I just wanted to know him. I just wanted to, you know, do his will. You know, humbly, like, you know, I saw the, 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 the wrong way I had lived my life. And my, my, my desire wasn't to become some mighty man of God, but to, to seek what, you know, to humbly seek what the Lord wanted. Um, it wasn't for personal gain or to secure an advantage over any other people. Or, you know, it was a sincere seeking. You know, discern, and you get that discernment. And like I said, you become more sensitive. Um, as I walk in this, like I said, I was talking about entertainment that I watch. We're talking about silly horror films. Well, like, it, it, like I, I watched it, I didn't feel right about it, and then later I was truly convicted because I watched the silly stuff. I was like, I can't do this. This is getting in the way of me and my relationship with God, even this benign thing. Um, or, or actually, in, in reality, it's not benign. It's, it's glorifying everything that's not God. Um, it's denying the power of God and the pow- and, and, and glorifying the, the, the pow- power of evil. Um, so, you know, we got to be sensitive to that. Discernment has one function. It's to distinguish right from wrong. So one manifestation, one manifestation of the Holy Spirit in a believer's life is this discerning of spirits, uh, which is the divinely enabled ability to discern a good spirit from a bad one. If you're not well versed in the wor- world, uh, in the word, <laughs> and are too well versed in the world, um, you're not going to be able to discern as much. You know what's right and wrong. You can't. You know what's your opinion? I don't care what your opinion is. You know, because we can all have different opinions about what's this and that, but the Word of God is the standard. You know, that's the truth. Um, you know, that's the way we'll be able to discern, you know, between good and evil. The ability to discern increases as we grow in character and in knowledge of God's Word. It's not one or the other. And like I said, if you think you're some sinless, uh, great person because you're not, you're not breaking all the, you know, the, the heavy duty sins. You, you, maybe it's time to study the word. Uh, maybe it's, you know, and try to grow in controlling that tongue. Who knows? Um, Hebrews 5, 13 and 14 tells us, For everyone who partakes only of milk is not accustomed to the word of righteousness, for he is an infant. But solid food is for the mature, who because of practice has their senses trained to discern good and evil. So yeah, it's, maturity is a thing that we should be striving for. Our religion shouldn't be like a pastime that we do once a week. Um, you know, our, our relationship with the Lord, you know, considers all aspects of our lives. Uh, spiritual discernment is not a function of the mind. You know, it's believe me, your your word processes. You know, the mind processes the word, but the function the function of the spirit is like a you know extra <laughs> extra sense. Um, uh, that's a bad choice of words. It's not ESP. It's spiritual discernment. Um, we rightly divide the word of truth with our minds, but the spirit enables us to discern that which cannot be objectively verified. Um, there will be times when you can discern that something is wrong, but not know what is wrong. In such cases, just share that you are sensing that something is wrong and don't guess what it is. Um, if you guess wrong, it will discredit your discernment. Like, if you start making these pronouncements, like, you know, it's this, that, and the other, you'll be 
you know, you'll discover that your knowledge isn't perfect, that your, your discernment's telling you something, but you don't know what it is. Um, that would be like a parent saying, what's wrong, Tommy? Have you been doing that, you know, what you're not supposed to do again? Well, while your discernment's probably right, if you guess the wrong thing, you know, Tommy's going to be mad at you for being wrongly accused, even though he's probably doing something else. Uh, another manifestation of the Spirit is the, is the word of knowledge. And that's a thing. I mean, that, that happened, you know, I can attest to that. It doesn't happen often. Um, and that's, I mean, that's the, uh, almost any testimony from a Christian, there will be moments of like you knew something that you had no business knowing. Uh, and that's because the Holy Spirit gave it to you. Um, and that's, and, and intuition sort of plays into that. Um, God has at times given believers words of knowledge. Anderson testifies of receiving words of knowledge. This rather conservative gentleman um, in counseling, you know, with with clients, will get a word of, you know, has gotten words of knowledge that helps in their care. Um, he's he's testifies to receiving words of knowledge in his counseling practice that he has tested and proven to be true. You know, so as for cessationists who say the gifts of the Spirit are dead, uh, I would disagree. Although. They're misunderstood as well because they're not really saying there's nothing. They're just not saying. I think they, their, their case is it's not as prevalent as some some sex of charismania would say. So I, I try to find balance. You might say, "Geez, you're you're all over the place." Well, I'm trying to find out what's true and not walk off into error. So uh, I'm going to tell you what I know and you know what's been tr- proven true and what's been proven not true. I've seen prophets um, speak over people's lives. Uh, like, you know, how many people can have a ministry? Um, apparently, everyone. Uh, if you go to the right prophet, um, because um, they're going to touch nations and, and do all kinds of things. And, and as far as I know, you know, a lot of the prophecies I've seen spoken over people in terms, of, especially in terms of ministry, um, I haven't seen come to pass. And now, you know. The New Testament prophet would say, well, that was on them. They didn't follow their prophecy. Well, well, <laughs> well, don't be, a, you know, I know you're, I guess that was an encouragement, um, you know, but, uh, or an exhortation. Um, but it seemed like, you know, it sounds like foretelling when you, when you put it that way, you know, um, I don't know. And when it doesn't come to pass, it makes, it makes everyone wonder. And I remember things. Um, so I, I expect a lot of the people I know to join me in ministry um, because <laughs> because I've seen a lot of people sw- spoken over that haven't necessarily uh, borne that fruit yet. I'll say yet because um, it's anything's possible with God. Um, so, but that's why we discern the spirits. We don't want to be led in error or deceive ourselves. You know, there is also counterfeit discernment, which leads some people to think they have the God-given ability to see uh, sins in people. Um, uh, Anderson tells of a, a client of his, her name was Lana, an undergraduate student, uh, who could point uh, out the sins of other students. Uh, while her discernment seemed to be accurate, her life was spiraling downward. Interviews revealed that Lana was oppressed by an evil spirit that enjoyed having power over people. After she was led to freedom, Lana no longer had the ability to point out the sins of others. Um, Her mind became so quiet that she had to learn to live without the noise from her companions who had cluttered her minds for years. So yeah, apparently her deal was, you know, I don't know, with, with, you know, pointing out people's sins, that might just be like, he looks like a, an adulterer to me, you know? <laughs> uh, it might have been, you know, but, but there was an evil spirit in this case. But, you know, in terms of that, um, that that's just reminded me of uh, uh, the, the story in Acts when, when Paul uh, cast out the demon from the girl who could tell the future and the guys who were like her owners or whatever got all upset because her powers were gone. Um, so, you know, there's scriptural basis for, for, for evil spirits, um, you know, using their powers for profit or in, and everything else um, and to hold power over people. And as we taught before, one of the lures to the occult 
is the the lure of power and knowledge. You know, when we look, so when we're seeking the Lord, we got to make sure we're seeking the Lord, not just the manifestations and the power, because um, we can find manifestations and power in in the dark side, in in in, in the kingdom of darkness. Um, you know, there's you can't tell a witch doctor he has no power. Um, the only thing is his power is satanic. Uh, or, or is more or less, you know, like potions or whatever. Um, you know, if we don't, and but in Lana's case, you know, where she, where she was, you know, doing all this stuff, uh, uh, if we don't have an accurate diagnosis, we can't prescribe the right remedy. You know, deceived people don't understand what is going on in their minds, so how can they accurately tell you what's going on? Even if they, they could, attempts to help them would, you know, have varying results depending on on what the counselor is looking for, uh, what their experience or education tells them is a possibility. You know, secular counselors trying to uh, help Lana would have considered the fo- all the following possibilities. You know, does she have a split personality? She got this. She's hearing voices and tell her people sins. You're like, what's that about? Split personality. Is she psychotic? Sounds pretty psychotic to me. Yeah, that's it. Um, does she have multiple personalities or an inner child from her past? Well, let's look at her past, see if there's trauma, or see if there's any you know abuse in her past that created a separate personality. Um, or is she just doing normal self-talk? Is this just a big act? Is this just her talking things out and making those best guesses? You know, oh, wow, he looks like a real... Uh, he looks like a real. He looks like a thief to me. That's his sin. Um, you know, any one of these diagnoses could have been made by secular counselors, depending on their education or experience. But none of these questions consider the possibility of unresolved spiritual conflicts, meaning oppression. You know, uh, of uh, a foothold for Satan being in there, uh, the influence of demonic spirits. If we don't consider it, we'll never cure it. Um, while not all mental and emotional problems are spiritual in nature, because we are aware of the possibility of, but because we're aware of the possibility of a spiritual cause, we can give the uh, the afflicted another avenue of hope. And quite frankly, you know, I don't think there's, you know, and Anderson said this in, in several of his, you know, well, somewhere in his books, because I've read read quite a few, um, that you know, it's really hard to, to separate the physical, the emotional, and, and the mental and the spiritual. Um, you know, it's it's hard to split them up. So it, it, it's hard to say that that you, you go to a psych ward and see people, you know, who are really ill, and uh, it's it's easy to to hypothesize that there might be something going on there in the spiritual realm as well. Um, unless you don't believe in it, then it's just pure psychosis. Um, so we keep those avenues of hope open by by presenting these. And what's the harm? Um, we give people, you know, we lead people in their faith to Christ, and we investigate their past and try to resolve their spiritual conflicts with repentance. And if their problems don't go away afterwards, then we can, you know, pursue other treatments. Um, there's nothing gained. Uh, there's nothing lost by, uh, by by seeking the Lord. The truth is that regardless of the problem or the cause, 100% of the people need Jesus Christ. And that's the truth. Um, and encouraging people to discover and claim their freedom in, in him is vital and necessary work. And, and that's it. And how do people know if they need it? If they, how do they know if they need their freedom if they, they don't even know what that is? You know? Oh, I believe in Jesus, but, you know, but what, what does to be free in Christ mean? You know, well, that's why we teach these classes, to, to show that the remedy to really all our problems lie in our faith in Jesus Christ. Uh, and for somebody who's laid a lot of his problems down, I can attest to that. Um, and I would encourage anyone to, you know, trust the Lord. You know, can he do that? Yes, he can. All things are possible with God. We have to follow him, trust him, and obey. Um, so, you know, we know about the dangers of deception. And then the, one of the biggest dangers is our, ourselves. Not keeping an open mind to, you know, uh, or an open eye on our experience to see what we've done to ourselves. Um, so I encourage everyone to examine your experience and, and question, um, am I being deceived? 
And hopefully the Holy Spirit will uh, point out what needs to be worked on and you'll agree with him. And uh, you can walk for- forward in your freedom and victory. Well, that's the lesson for this evening. I thank everyone for, uh, for being here this evening. And I thank everyone for listening on the podcast. Uh, let me just close in prayer. Lord God, Heavenly Father, uh, we thank you, Lord, for you know, your truth, your way, and your life that you've given each one of us when we put our faith in Jesus Christ. We pray, Lord God, I pray for the families of everyone listening tonight that they would um, get a revelation of Jesus Christ as a Lord, and Savior, and Deliverer. Um, Lord, and that they would, um, they would, they, everyone listening would be a beacon of hope to the people in their lives to show that there's a way um, when there looks like there's no way, that there's there's a hope when it looks like there's no hope, and that life and that hope and that way is Jesus Christ. Lord God, thank you for uh, bringing us all together again. We pray that you bring us again next week for the final lesson of this series. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.